I'm going to go ahead and start the mode. Because people will figure out what's going on. So we're going to start out with a quick documentary. Then we're going to talk about student loans today and this bubble that's been created. Then we're going to talk about engaging allies, which I'm going to get some assistance on from someone that's been very active in students occupying DC. So the movie's about 27 minutes long. It's called Default the Student Loan Documentary. Uh, if you want to show this on your campus, just let me know and I'll make sure you have access to this video. So, yeah. And so we're feeling, you know, because I wanted to go to school and I wanted to get my master's degree, the rest of my life is dramatically altered. Can I get married? You know, can real, real questions, can I honestly have children because of the loan? And, you know, I don't feel like I can do that. I think it's easier for financial aid offices to say, well, it's not our responsibility. We're giving you all the information, so you know you have to figure it out. But what does an 18-year-old know about private loans and direct loans? When I was signing those those promissory notes, I mean, I didn't really look at the interest rate. I didn't really care. I just wanted to get the money so they wouldn't kick me out of school. There's absolutely a student loan bubble. And if it hasn't already popped, it's about to. during the school year and more than 60 hours a week during the summer. 
and somehow I still ended up with more than thirty thousand dollars of debt after I graduated. I have parking loans and direct loans, and I'm a work study student. I have another job as well on the side, and I still have to take out private loans. I am currently around. I, I currently have around forty thousand dollars in debt, and by the end of my four years, I would probably be a little bit over sixty thousand dollars in debt. Generation ago, the Pell Grant covered almost three quarters of the cost of going to a four-year school. Today, it covers around a third. What that means is your average Pell Grant is probably going to cover, hopefully, the cost of books for a year, and not much more than that. So a low-income student who gets a Pell Grant still has a lot of cost to cover, and they don't have parents who can help them cover some of those costs. It never occurred to me that I would not make a lot of money after going to law school. So repayment never seemed like a daunting task to me because I just always assumed I'm going to a, a great law school, I'm going to graduate, have a law degree, and get paid lots of money. And I could pay back my loans quickly and easily. I just kept looking at these bills piling up. They were getting higher and higher, and I was looking at at least another two to three years full time to complete my degree. And also, I didn't see any way that you know I was going to be able to pay these back. And I thought, well, I really should start looking for a journalism job and go to work. I was actually training for USA, and I started to get a really bad headache. And that headache turned into uh, an even worse headache, and I couldn't go to school anymore. And I ended up having something called a pseudo tumor cerebrite. And so I had to drop out of school my senior year of college so that I could have brain surgery. I had to leave school for an entire semester. I tried to catch up in the summer, and I just ended up with double the debt because the school wouldn't give me back the money because I had gotten sick at the end of the semester. The reality of higher education in America today is that only about half of people who begin a degree program actually complete it within one and a half times the allotted time. Those people who do graduate, two thirds of them take out student loans. People commonly talk about the undergraduate student loans and the average of about twenty thousand dollars for people with a bachelor's degree. But for those in graduate school, the numbers get much much bigger. Well, master's degrees advance the numbers in the thirty thousands. For law students, I believe the average is over a hundred thousand, and for medical students, it's about one hundred fifty thousand in both federal and private student loans. I received an offer to work as an assistant just to turn in Brooklyn, and my starting salary was thirty six thousand dollars per year. And I had to make a decision between paying back my student loans or paying for rent. I couldn't do both. My rent was $1,000 per month, and I was earning about $1,800 per month. And there was nothing left to pay for student loans. So I placed them into forbearance. I got my first bill for my student loans, and the first bill uh, was a total of about $1,000. And um, it was quite a shock. I was expecting to save the loan around five hundred dollars a month. After that shock, uh, I had three months warning that my payment was due, and it took me that three months to save up a thousand dollars to make my first payment. And after making my first payment, I owed more money than I owed before I made my first payment. After interest charges had been applied. After I graduated, when you the payments were scheduled to be, I think, somewhere around $1,400. Owing to the default, that was a huge addition to the loan at that point. And currently now, it's, it's roughly about $2,000 per month. People always talk about the, the, the million dollar diploma, right? The advantage of your degree over a lifetime, uh, if you get a bachelor's degree versus not getting a bastard's degree. But that, that advantage has actually gotten bigger since the 1970s. Not because the bachelor's degree people are earning more, but it's because the people without a bachelor's degree are earning less. So the top line is really flat, the bottom line is going down, and that advantage is getting bigger. But for the people who are just getting a bachelor's degree, the bonus or the payoff of that degree has not actually been growing. It's actually in the last decade, it's been getting a little bit smaller. Well, I initially did it, I had no idea what programs was. 
Um, all I knew was that I didn't have to pay back my loans at that time, so I was more than happy to do. So for the next five years, while working as an ADA, my loans just increased. They were, they were like I said, I owed about sixty-five thousand dollars. By the end of my five-year tenure, I had um, probably an additional twenty-five thousand dollars in debt. I called Sally May and I asked them, how did it get to be $54,000 when originally it was only $32,000? Oh, well, that's your forbearance. I said, my forbearance? I don't understand. Well, you signed the loan papers. You should be responsible. Do you want us to send them to you? I said, can I renegotiate the loan? Oh, absolutely not, unless you go back to school. Excuse me. I'm, I was like 60 years old. Would I really want to go back to school? I don't think so. Little did I know that the lenders are more than happy to let you put your loans into forbearance because of a racket called compounding interest. Basically what it is is that um, the interest continues to accumulate while the loan is in forbearance and that interest gets tacked onto the principal. So the interest increases exponentially as the amount gets tacked onto the principal. So it's sort of a snowball effect. Um, once, once the process of forbearance starts, your loans start to grow and grow and grow. And that's what happened to me. The City of Bank Student Loan Corporation would send me these notices and they'd say, you are on deferment or you are on forbearance or you are on your, uh, your grace period having left school. This is just to notify you of your interest rates. And then they started sending me one saying, this is just to notify you of the change in your interest rates. And it was like, it was like watching the odometer on a car. There's no limit to what they can charge in terms of fees and penalties if you go into delinquency or default. And so, since they have the power to take your $12,000 student loan and turn it into $40,000 of penalties, why wouldn't they do that? I mean, why wouldn't they want to charge you absolutely as much as they possibly could, knowing that they'll never settle? You know, knowing that uh, courts have found that people's uh, social security payments and their, their, their federal disability payments can be seized to pay back old student loans. Uh, or even their disaster relief payments from the federal government if you're in an earthquake or a hurricane. So, you know, knowing that they're going to get their money, they might as well put it down and you owe as much money as possible. And that sort of seems to be the thinking behind their delinquency and their default policies. Unfortunately, very little data are collected on private loans. However, one recent indicator is that a big for-profit college company called Corinthian Colleges told its investors a few months ago that they were going to make about $130 million of their own private loans to their own low-income students in this fiscal year, and they expected defaults to be around 58%. It's really sort of a three-headed beast, comprising uh, the lenders, Congress, and the universities. You have the universities who are raising their tuition, but you also have this lending industry that is sitting there, you know, funding Congress to the tune of, you know, tens of millions of dollars per year, who also are pushing to get the loan limits increased, and also are, frankly, responsible for having all the consumer protections uh, that were taken away, taken away. For whatever reason, Congress has decided to treat student loan debt completely differently than every other type of debt. So you can discharge your gambling debts in bankruptcy, but you can't discharge your student loan debt in bankruptcy. And that makes absolutely no sense. And that one sort of exception to the bankruptcy law, I think, really provides um, an indication of the extraordinary power that the student loan industry has um, in our political system. Once you make that decision to sign the promissory note and become a Sally May uh, customer, you're done with them. You can't get rid of that loan. There's no discharging in bankruptcy. And they make more money the worse you do with that loan. They kind of want you to be in delinquency and they kind of even want you to be in default, assuming you keep paying it back. And you probably are going to keep paying it back because you don't have any choice. So if you just look at their basic business model, they don't want to be nice to you. And so, all of the people that I've heard from, it doesn't seem like Sally May ever makes a mistake in anybody's favor. If they ever make a mistake, it's against the student. You know, if, if you look at it, if you look at it in the roundhouse and you said it was $30,000 to go to UNR for three years, they now say that I owe about $90,000, so it's triple. I originally borrowed $46,000 from 
from my part of the Sumalong. And I think when we spoke a year and a half ago, I think it was approximately 80,000 to 90,000. And now that figure in July 2009 is $122,000. I borrowed $35,000. I paid back 20, um, $25,000, $26,000. And I still owe $57,000. So in relationship to the cost that I have now it is two hundred thousand dollars, which is maybe one of the few times I've ever said it out loud. Uncomfortable. I was actually kind of worried about taking the amount. So right now, you know, I'm in about $80,000 in student loan debt. I, I don't even know how much medical debt I'm in because my mom kind of keeps up with those bills because it's just too daunting for me. And I'm in about $5,000 of credit card debt. So I do this work because, I do this work because I don't want anybody to feel the way I feel. You know, I don't want the banks to call you know, their job and tell them that they owe them so much money. And it's, it's difficult. And these people at, at our conference, I just want them to understand that they don't have to go through this. And that, you know, if they want to go to school, they should try to get a scholarship or they should try to get grants. And they should definitely take out money from the federal government because the private loan industry they don't care about people. You know, when I told them, look, I don't make that much money. I make $34,000 a year. There's no way I could spend six or $900 a month paying just for loans. And they said, well, there's nothing we can do about it. I really feel like I am not going to have any legitimate credit the rest of my life. And that's a hard thing for a number of reasons, and like future purchases, and the girl that I'm living with right now in this apartment. Um, crazy about her, she's the best person in the world. I mean, really. Um, I was like, you know, I don't know if I can continue this relationship because I don't want, you know, I don't want to. Uh, I mean, you know, I just don't want to bring you into this thing right now. I was talking to a friend of mine about this who happens to be a loan officer. And he tried to reassure me that, you know, things will be better. That we are not um, a country with a debtor's prison. But the more and more I think about it, Maybe we are, we just don't know. First of all, we need your sense of hope. I don't need to tell you that your classmates are worried about whether there are jobs after school. That some of your former classmates are fighting wars all across this globe. That this year alone, more than 400,000 young people will not go to college because they can't afford it. <laughs> and yet, despite all the bad news you read online in the morning, I believe you've got hope. It is imperative that consumer protections be returned to students. People don't realize that the most basic, fundamental consumer protections that we take for granted with every other type of loan simply don't exist for student loans. We're constantly being told about how far behind America is lagging compared to other industrialized nations in terms of math and science and whatnot. But we're not paying for it. We need to actually put our money where our mouth is. The federal government spends about seven times as much on people over the age of 65 as we do on uh, everybody from the age of zero to about 25. As our country continues to age demographically in the next 10 or 15 years, uh, younger people's issues, in particular in higher education, are going to be perpetually pushed to the back burner. So the onus is really on young people to organize and to agitate for their own uh, causes and their own beliefs. We need to see more students lobbying to their elected officials. We need to see more students understanding how their state and federal budgets are affecting their experiences in higher education. We need to see more students draw links to higher education to even broader economic justice issues. 
What do you want out of your higher education? Do you want to go to school for little to no money? Tell us how we should how we should message it, and we'll do it. On January 29th, 2009, I was watching the news, and I believe that was the day that news broke about the CEO of Merrill Lynch and his exorbitant Marie Antoinette-like office redecorations. And this was in the wake of the $700 billion TARP bailout. Instead of throwing trillions of dollars at the banks, insurance companies, and other financial institutions that were responsible for the mess to begin with, I thought we as a society would be better served by forgiving everyone's student loan debt and putting hundreds, and in some cases thousands of extra dollars per month, every month, into the hands of middle class educated consumers. So I wrote what I thought was a pretty good essay, laying out my proposal, and I posted it to a group on Facebook. And as of today, there are over 233,000 members of the group. I recognize how radical and dramatic the proposal to forgive the student loan debt of all Americans really is. I get it. I'm basically asking the taxpayers for a $700 billion bill. We've already done that several times in the last year. We need to not be quiet. We need to not suffer individually uh, in silence about this issue. Uh, we need to come together. We need to solve it. I was watching 60 Minutes one Sunday evening, and it was Alan College uh, talking to Leslie Stahl. And they said that there's a guy that's starting a grassroots movement in Washington State. Well, we're, we're just asking college students to sort of random about the student loan issue. Do you remember ever having a choice of who you borrow the money from? Do you remember actually making a decision about who to borrow? organization to stand up and be vocal from a grassroots perspective about the problem. Before student loan justice was in existence, uh, the student loan issue was rarely, if ever, covered by the popular media. Since we've started, however, we've been featured in dozens of television shows, including 60 Minutes, uh, Frontline, 2020, uh, and others. Our mission is to convince Congress to restore standard, basic consumer protections to student loans. Getting Congress to move, now that is another challenge. But you know, anybody, anywhere can go down and get a meeting with either their elected official or you know, their staff. I, mean, I suggest that they feel more comfortable acting in a group, that they should come to studentloanjustice.org. And you know, they can find dozens, if not hundreds, of people in their home states that they can plan and coordinate with and get together with and, and act jointly with. I actually think that if a bunch of us, you know, outed ourselves and said, I'm in eighty thousand dollars of debt, you know, then somebody else would say, I'm in forty five thousand dollars worth of debt. And then we would actually realize that it's the banks the private lending companies who are the only people benefiting from these programs. And all we're doing is pushing ourselves deeper and deeper into debt. I'm hopeful that that growing awareness and that growing sense of a consumer movement will help make sure that for those who need to borrow, borrowing is safer and less burdensome. And hopefully that there's less need to borrow because we have more grant aid and better financing of our education. We have to have doctors, we have to have lawyers, we have to have microbiologists, and we have to have newspaper reporters and public school teachers and professional photographers and all of that. And those are all jobs that, those are all careers that require a significant amount of education. An educated society is a more just society. The more of us that are educated, the better we can all do because we can all make better decisions. Essenism is an option for people that aren't 
actually in immediate danger. Once you get into immediate danger, optimism is the only option. You have to keep working on solutions. If you're not working on solutions, you're just making things worse. And so that's really been a credo that I try to live by. I used to be much more of a gloom and doom person by nature. I imagined a lot of very scary scenarios, and I would get hooked on sort of apocalyptic, you know, literally apocalyptic ideas about you know, the future of capitalism, the future of the country, the future of the planet. And all of those things are true, but I think to the extent that you believe that there are real problems in the world, energy is best focused on solutions. In this economy, the high school diploma no longer guarantees a good job. That's why I urge the Senate to follow the House and pass a bill that will revitalize our community college. And let's sell another one million students. And when they graduate, they will be required to pay only 10% of their income on student loans. And all of their debt will be forgiven after 20 years. And forgiven after 10 years if they choose a career in public service. Because in the United States of America, no one should go broke because they chose to go to college. So the first time I ever saw this, it really blew me away. And it was particularly, particularly hard because Carmen, uh, I used to work with her. And she had never told me her situation. That's how I found out. And she was sitting in the same room as me. And she just like broke down with her. Because no one else in the room. But in 2012, student debt will surpass a trillion dollars. Every minute, six million dollars is added to student debt in this country. So that's the situation we're in. That's, this is bigger than credit card debt. And like they talk about in the movie, there's no way to default on. They can garnish wages, they can garnish social security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid is affected by affects your credit. So, in doing work around this issue, something I realized is there is actually a cycle in how all of this happens. So the first step is students take out loans, and we do this because we can't afford to go to school. Because tuition's going up, student fees are going up, Pell Grant's getting cut. And I think these are the exact numbers. I only mail it out to folks if you need it. 1978, the Pell Grant covered somewhere around 72% of college education. In 2010, it covered 32%. Okay. Those, if you look at the inverse of that, 
And that's after Reaganomics were enacted. That's after Bush, Obama, Clinton, the other Bush, like all of them. So students take out loans. So you then have these lenders that make profit off of the interest. What they then do with the profit is they go over here and they lobby Congress. And when they lobby Congress, what they're saying is, don't increase the Pell Grant. Don't put regulations and restrictions on us. Don't cap what student debt can go up to. Keep it a free market sort of thing, which forces students to take out more loans. There's less protections, there's more cuts. So we're caught in a cycle that we can't seem to break up. So there are different ways to kind of tackle the student debt cycle that I'm going to get into, but something else we've been thinking about recently at Student Labor Action Project, which is the project that I coordinate, is the role of our universities plays, because it's actually bigger than just we take out loans and they make profit off the interest. It's happening in a couple of different levels. Who does your university keep its money with? Chase. Chase. Does anyone know anything about Chase Bank? <laughs> well, they are evil. They, so they did predatory lending on houses. Uh, they're one of the largest holders of student debt. Uh, you're with SUNY? Yes. Do you know who SUNY keeps its money with? Who your individual school does? No, I know where my student loans are. I mean, I'm thinking about banking in a bigger way. Banking? I know that my university is involved with the Federal Credit Union locally. Good. Let's go. Um, but, and I think that's, I'm not sure what the entire SUNY system does because it's a really big system. Yeah. Do you know who? Uh, Bank of America. And then before that, the community college system is involved with Wolf's Fargo. Any idea who your school banks with? Yeah, it's James. So, it's not just students take out loans. It's this bigger problem of schools keep money with them. And then, once again, they make profit off of the interest. And then they use the same money we're keeping with them to lobby Congress to screw us over. So. The two things I want to get into, one thing is there's now been this call to get your university to move its money. This is a blog that went up on Valentine's Day called We're Breaking Up. And it was about three institutions that moved their money. Uh, the United States Student Association, which I work for, we were actually banking with Wells Fargo. We pulled out over a million dollars with them. Uh, the Uni United Council of University of Wisconsin Students, who was banking with MNI Bank, who was the second largest uh, donor to Governor Scott Walker. And then the <coughs> University of California Student Association, who was banking with U.S. Bank, who did predatory lending there, housing foreclosures, things like that. So there's been this call to, from Occupy, there's been this call to move your money. November 5th was the first big day where it's like, move your money day. We're realizing these institutions can move millions and millions of dollars out of them and that's your school's money. You should have a say in where that money's kept. Because if it's going back to these large lenders that are forcing our entire generation to deal with those numbers right there, we should have a call to move it. To credit unions, local banks, community owned banks, everything like that. And if you go here, it will give you a resolution to move your money, it will give you tools on like where to find a nearby credit union, and we're getting the entire systems to move their money. If you go to the bottom, there's actually a community college in California that's moving $140 million. Um, I guess I wanted to mention, mention, I heard about this action, and before I, I just uh, transferred to Albany. Um, before I was studying in CUNY here in New York City, 
and I was looking for credit unions to transfer my money to. Um, and as a student in, in the CUNY system, I don't, I couldn't find any. Uh, I don't think there are actual credit unions for New York City students. So um, a lot of schools are having to create them. Uh, one of the schools I work very closely with, United, our University of Central Florida, when they were trying to divest from Chase and SunTrust, where their school kept the two bank accounts, they actually had called for a creation of a credit. So when they presented the demands to the university, it wasn't just divest from Chase and SunTrust, it was, and you also need to create a credit union that students can bank with, because that didn't exist. So <coughs> we had to create new institutions as well as pull money from bad institutions. Fortunate that upstate New York, um, there's a uh, called the State Employees Federal Credit Union, and SUNY students are generally eligible for those. Yeah. So there's this whole move your money piece. We're breaking up with our banks. Uh, mm -hmm. Moving back to the student debt bubble, and it is a bubble. We're trying to find new ways to force a renegotiation of student debt. And you actually heard, I think it was Francis and Steve both mentioned it. And it's probably because I was talking to them right before the panel about it. There's been a new movement started that SLAP and the United States Student Association are participating in and help lead to get 100,000 students to sign a pledge card saying, I'm not going to pay back my student debt. We're not saying default or anything. But we want a coordinated, organized action where instead of sending in a check for one month, you send in a postcard that actually says, I'm not paying this back. Five minutes. I'm not paying this back because of your unfair practices with the community, with my friends, with my family. Imagine the public crisis that would happen if 100,000 students, instead of sending a check in, sent a postcard that said, no, not this time. Like, does everyone remember the Occupy Wall Street thing where it was the video on, like, put uh, wood and stuff and mail it back to the banks because it cost them money? What if that was happening, but it was forcing them to renegotiate? So it wasn't just, we're going to cost you more money. It's going to say, we're not giving you our money. We're taking it back. What would that look like? What would that do to our economy? Like, honestly, how do people think folks would respond? <coughs> The silence of thinking about something like this, 100,000 people saying no in an organized fashion, like, do you think the news would care? <laughs> do you think Sally Mae would care? Do you think other students would look at that and go, that's a real option? I think we all would get the first 10,000 though. Wow. I mean, actually. We're at 50,000. <laughs> no, I've slowly been chipping away at it. It's not easy, and like it's a scary thing because yeah. this does affect your credit. Like that's why I say very specifically, don't default. Not asking you to default. It's got to be a coordinated action. One person not paying their student loans just means you get a penalty. It's got to be a collective action. There's power in collective action. That's why we talk about general strikes. That's why we talk about unions. That's why we talk about student unions. It's got to be collective. Because if it's just a one-on-one -on -one interaction, Sally Mae does have the power to say, we'll send our credit people after you. You're gonna get the phone calls, you're gonna get the letters. If it's 100,000 people, a million people, they can't do that. They actually have to respond. They would have to come out with a public statement saying, all right, so we got all these postcards, we hear that there's a crisis. Obama would have to come out and say, so, there's, so this is apparently a crisis. Obama would actually have to address this. Have you ever heard him say, there's a trillion dollars in student debt and that's not okay? Like even when he was talking at the very end of that documentary, he was, <coughs> you know, you should have to be burdened. They won't say how bad it is because they don't want people to know how atrocious this has become. This isn't sustainable. This isn't a future. This isn't real. <coughs> but with that, so there's going to be this coordinated action to try to intentionally pop a bubble. That way they have to respond on our terms instead of us chasing them on theirs. If you go to studentlabor.org, you can find out more there. There's an online petition and different ways that 
you can get engaged since we're actually on the website. So if, you, if you click action, this is where you'll find everything. Where it's the given form, you'll see defaults right there, the petition, share your story, move your money, and our national conference. So you can see all that. But I want to talk about how we can engage local allies. So I'm going to hand it over. Hello all, this is Richard. Um, I'm Andrine, I work with the Students Occupy DC movement. And this is one of the things that we're trying to do is on March 1st, uh, in coordination with national efforts, if you look inside your folders, you have these nice non-shiny flyers that <coughs> talk about the student debt spring, uh, spring week of action. And so on Thursday, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be marching from the Occupy DC McPherson Square uh, going to Sally May and explaining why we're not very happy with them, and then going over to the Department of Education and saying, hey, come on, you need to help us with this. Um, uh, some of the stuff that we're doing on that day is we're going to, we've been working on a list of grievances and de slash demands, we haven't decided which is which, um, and that we're going to present to both the Department of Education and Sally May. We're going to look, book block them, we're going to paper them with student no notices of so instead of getting loan notices, we're going to give them notices about how what they're doing is not very fair. Um, but sort of what we're talking about today is sort of like the outreach. Um, one of the things we found very useful is that uh, in among the DC, there's a lot of different local universities that exist within DC. There's Howard University, George Washington, American University, Georgetown, etc. We have, every week we have a general assembly where we go to a different school every week and come together and talk about some of this different stuff we're doing. This action would not work if it was one school. There are approximately five people in occupied GW. Five people is not a march. But if you take the um, American University, 30, 60 kids, and you take the George Washington kids, and you take the Georgetown kids, and you take the uh, Howard University kids, and you Tufts, like if you combine everyone together, we can get a march that's going to be very significant. Oh, we have a map up there. Um, and we also tried to get a lot of our different allies, so the actual Occupy DC camp, they come and said, hey, you guys, you need to come and be part of our march and come support us on this march. So has anyone worked with Occupy so far? around student debt or anything like this? A little bit? What was that experience like? Well, so I guess the, the context is we, we kind of, we have like nothing to do with our school. We have an Occupy camp for a week. Um, but the main issue that came up was, of course, extreme issues for our university campus. Um, and I think, I mean, like student loan debt and college access for building all those things are things I really care about and it's really frustrating because the, it's easy to perceive that other students don't really care that much about it. But it turns out, once you actually start the conversation, a lot of students really do care about it. So I think it's really empowering to help students actually do know what's going on, just that um, it, the, the organization's not quite there yet. So something we were actually talking about last night is we have to organize these spaces to where they need to be. It can't just be this frustration, I'm giving up, I'm walking away, Consensus doesn't work. How many times do we have to go through that? By the way, <laughs> I frame consensus as I consent to you doing this action, not if we all have to agree on every single thing. That's my quick take on that. But we need to be engaging students in Occupy and occup occupations around this issue. This is this is the forefront of what they're talking about, and we need to find ways to collaborate. But uh, <coughs> also just a quick few things. Then we're all going to go down for lunch. If you have any interest in visiting Sally May, their shareholder meeting is May 24th. <laughs> it's going to be held in Delaware. <coughs> Specifically in Newark. And in order to go in and tell Sally May what you think, you just need to own one share, which costs roughly 1380. Buy it two months in advance. There's going to be some other people joining you. But thank you everyone for coming up and talking about student debt. I really appreciate it. Thank you.